Hello, and welcome back to The Pastor Study. I'm the pastor, Dave Thomas, and we're here in my study on the campus of Cross of Christ Lutheran Church in beautiful Bellevue, Washington. And this is our study for the text for Sunday, October 18th, 2020, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. This is also a bit of a milestone for us. This is episode 25 of The Pastor Study. Thanks for joining me here today and for joining me in any of the episodes in the past. And if you've been here for all 25, wow, that's, uh, that's awesome. Thanks. I hope that you have been blessed. And I pray that today will be a blessing as well. We are blessed with some interesting texts to share again this Sunday. Beginning with the Hebrew Scriptures, our first reading is from Isaiah 45, 1 to 7. A little bit of background. The context is the Babylonian exile, in fact, well into it, about 50 years. And Cyrus, who will be named in our reading, is the king of the powerful nation of Persia, what is present-day Iran, known in history books as Cyrus the Great for many reasons, uh, for his long reign, for expansion of the empire, for his military might, for his many building projects, for his really, um, I want to say groundbreaking, but more than that, uh, unprecedented uh, approaches to government and uh, even to uh, early understanding of human rights. So uh, Cyrus the Great is a part of our Bible story this week. Cyrus lived from about 600 to 530 BC. He ruled for about 30 of those years. He's named in the Bible uh, on 23 occasions and alluded to several more times. Now, Cyrus was the king of Persia when the Babylonian captivity ended, and it ended by his actions. In the first year of his reign, he was uh, prompted by God to decree that the temple in Jerusalem would be rebuilt and the exiles returned. And as such, he was and is remembered as uh, God's instrument of liberation. Um, Cyrus not only set the prisoners free, but he sent them along with uh, sacred vessels that had been taken in the, from the first temple uh, that he uh, conquered uh, from the Babylonians uh, and a considerable sum of money from his own treasury, uh, you know, not his personal treasury, the, the king's treasury, uh, to buy building materials to reestablish the temple. Um, all right, so as we'll hear in the reading, the Bible tells us of God choosing or anointing Cyrus to liberate his people from Babylon and pave the way for their return to Jerusalem and to Jer Judea and the rebuilding of the temple. That's the context. The reading begins in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, that is Yahweh, to his anointed. Now, anointing was a sign of God's choosing and of God's placing a person into a position. Uh, kings were anointed. Uh, prophets sometimes were anointed. Um, the judges were anointed. Uh, an example, of course, is young David anointed to be, uh, to be the king of Israel. The Hebrew word for anointed is uh, Mashiach which is uh, Messiah, right? Uh, Messiah means the anointed one. So throughout scripture, God has anointed, uh, called forth Messiahs, uh, anointed ones for his purpose. But never before had it been a foreigner, much less the uh, king of a powerful and militaristic uh, empire. So uh, in verse one here, Yahweh uh, says that he is anointing Cyrus. He has anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped. The reading continues. That uh, grasping of the right hand uh, was a symbol in the ancient Near East of having been chosen by the divine. The gods or God has, has uh, grasped you or held you by the right hand. To subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him and the gates shall not be closed. So God chose Cyrus to use his political and military power primarily to overthrow Babylon. Verse 2, I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the riches hidden in secret places. That is, 
the booty of war, the treasuries of the nations that Cyrus will conquer. So that you may know that I, the Lord, that I, Yahweh, the God of Israel, who call you, who calls you by your name, uh, for this sake, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. So Cyrus wasn't a Jew. He was Persian. He was not a God-fearer, the title, description, sometimes given in the Old Testament to those who were interested in and following at least some aspects of Jewish teachings. He was um, one who didn't know Yahweh, but Yahweh knew him, and he would use Cyrus for his purposes. Verse 5, I am the Lord. There is no other. Beside me, there is no God. Now, not only is this a proclamation that Yahweh is a God, but that Yahweh is the only God. And it was counter to the views of most of the world at that time, uh, the views that there were many gods, that each nation had their own God or gods. This was a polytheistic um, worldview, uh, a belief in many gods and goddesses. God, that is Yahweh, counters this claim. And he's willing to prove it to and through Cyrus. So returning to verse 5, I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, from the east to the west, that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Now Cyrus' empire was described as, as expanding from the east to the, to the west, uh, from Persia, from Iran, uh, eastward, um, into uh, what we would call, you know, the Medi Mediterranean Europe, westward into Mediterranean Europe, and eastward into uh, the Indus uh, River, uh, into India. So um, Cyrus was a, a, a good instrument for God to use to uh, show from east to west uh, who God was. Let's see, verse 7, I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. So secular history books remember Cyrus for his many mighty military acts, for his long reign, for his expansion of the Persian Empire. He is um, greatly honored in many places. Uh, in Iran, he is called the father, uh, father of his nation, uh, the father of modern um, governance, the one who bridged the East and the West. Uh, he's remembered throughout history and was a model for many empire builders, including uh, the American founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson was um, one who admired and read of and about Cyrus. Uh, but he is primarily remembered in, in, um, in the faith as the liberator of the Jews from their forced exile in Babylon. But it is the Bible that gives God all the credit and remembers Cyrus um, merely, if you will, merely as an instrument of divine will. So we move on now to the psalm, and I'll tell you, um, some might say I am warning you, that I've written an original song based on the verses uh, from our psalm today uh, for this Sunday, uh, based on the message translation, which we're using this week. It's a stay home uh, Sunday, uh, and I ha will be um, singing and uh, playing and recording that song for our worship service, so fair warning. Psalm 96 is a psalm of praise. It's sometimes called by scholars uh, an enthronement psalm, a praise of God on his throne, God the ruler. Uh, and in I as in Isaiah, the psalmist will declare that Yahweh alone is God. Uh, for our study uh, today, we won't use the message version. We'll hear that Sunday, but we'll use the New Revised Standard Version of the psalm and for all of our readings. We're beginning at verse 1, and we'll go through verse 9. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. So the psalmist begins with imperatives of praise, that is, commandments to sing and bless and tell and declare of the greatness of God. And now, 
uh, we're given some of the reasons for that praise. Uh, God's greatness is enumerated. Verse 4, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to re be revered above all gods, that is lowercase g, as we'll see. Verse 5, for all the gods of the people are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. As noted earlier, the psalmist proclaims that God, that Yahweh, is the only true and living God. Verse 6. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. And then again, we move back to the call or commandment or the imperative to worship and praise. Verse um, 7, actually. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. So we'll note that the call here to worship is not exclusive, not only for one nation, Israel, or one people, the Jewish people, but it is inclusive, the families of the peoples, that is, all nations and tribes and languages and people groups, uh, and uh, in the end, um, all the earth. We'll also see that while worship begins with people coming before God in praise, it extends to people going out into the world to declare God's glory and strength and splendor to others. So uh, a movement up to God and out into the world. All right, moving on now to the second lesson. This is the uh, very beginning of the first letter from Apostle, the Apostle Paul to the Christians of Thessalonica, uh, which was then a Roman port city in Macedonia. It is uh, uh, still exists. Uh, Thessalonica, as it is, um, well, that's probably not even right, but more closely uh, pronounced in modern day Greece. In fact, uh, it remains the second largest city in Greece today uh, after only Athens. A um, little bit of Thessaloniki or Thessalonica trivia uh, was founded in 315 BC by King Cassander of Macedon uh, and named for his wife, Thessaloniki who was half-sister of Alexander the Great and Princess of Macedonia being the daughter of Philip II. So there you go, a little water cooler trivia for you. But I digress, as I so often do. So let's get back to this letter written uh, to uh, this church that was planted by Paul and others uh, during his missionary journeys in this major Greco-Macedonian city. Verse 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the salutation. We'll unpack a couple of folks there for you. Silvanus is the Roman form of the Greek name Silas, which we know this disciple by uh, more well-known. It's the name uh, used in the Acts of the Apostles. Silvanus and Silas, uh, just two versions of the same name. Uh, not uncommon at that time, and of course not in ours either. Um, you know, uh, my first name is John, which can also be Jose or Johan or Ian. Um, so Sylvanus and Silas. Silas accompanied Paul on his first and secondary mis second missionary journeys. He's found in scripture preaching, uh, in uh, church planting. He's found in prison with Paul. Uh, but he escapes when God causes an earthquake to open the prison cells and uh, break the chains that had bound Paul and Silas. But he's most often found assisting Paul in um, many and sundry ways. Timothy was a young disciple Paul took under his wing, uh, whom Paul uh, is credited with pinning two letters to in the New Testament, First and Second Timothy. Timothy means honored by God. Paul and Timothy met during Paul's second missionary journey, and uh, Timothy went on with him from there. Now, Silvanus, or Silas, and Timothy, and fellow Pauline protege, uh, Titus, are together commemorated in the ELCA on January 26th. That is their commemoration, or uh, the day uh, remembering these three in the Lutheran calendar of saints. So it is really... Um, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, who together are writing to the Thessalonians, with the apostle, no doubt, taking the lead. So, continuing on, here's what they write. Grace to you and peace. Verse 2, we always give thanks to God for all 
of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that's uh, quite a trio of Christian characteristics to be known for, right? Work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of faith. Verse 4, for we know, brothers and sisters, that you are beloved by God, that he has chosen you. And here we hearken to Cyrus, right? And others chosen and anointed by God. Verse 5, because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So Paul says, um, actually Paul and Silas and and, uh, Timothy uh, say together, the proof is in the pudding here, right? Uh, Paul recognizes that the faith community in Thessalonica uh, bear the marks of the Holy Spirit uh, in the depth of their faith, in their actions, uh, which we're about to see. So let's continue on in verse 5. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you you for your sake, and you have become imitators of us. The Greek word here is uh, mimites. Uh, It's uh, where we get the word mimic. Imitators, mimics of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you have become an example. The Greek word here is typos or typos. Uh, It means an example, a modern, a pattern, a type, a, a paradigm. You will become a typos, uh, an example, a model for all believers in Macedonia and uh, Achaia. Uh, That's the term for the southern part of Greece. So Macedonia, here we go. Here's my invisible map again. Uh, Macedonia is in the north, kind of goes this way. And uh, Achaia or Achaia is in the south. Uh, It's the part of southern Greece today that, that includes Athens and Corinth. Verse eight. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. Uh, in Greek, that is uh, rung forth, sounded forth, rung forth, like a, like a bell, like a church bell. The word of the Lord has rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak of it. Verse 9, for the people of those regions report about us, Report to us about what kind of welcome we had received among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. We're sensing a connective theme here in our text, right? The one true God. And now wait for his son from heaven, whom we ra- whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. So the faith and action of the Thessalonians had become well-known, so much so that others reported back to Paul what Paul already knew uh, about how faithfully this church was living out the gospel. So we might stop and ask ourselves, what is our reputation? What's the reputation of our church? What's the reputation of cross of Christ? What are we known for? Are we known in our own community, much less beyond? Um, If people know cross of Christ, what do they know about us? What are we known for? What's our reputation? All right, finally, we come to the gospel. This is our preaching text for this week. It's from Matthew's account, uh, chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. We'll continue to look at this more closely uh, in our sermon this Sunday. This is, uh, again, the time uh, that Jesus spent in Jerusalem after his entry his triumphant entry, which we remember each Palm Sunday, and prior to his betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion. We've uh, encountered Jesus in the temple in the last few Sundays, teaching, uh, turning over the tables of the money changers, and uh, uh, encountering opposition, as he will again today from the religious ruling class. This story is well known, but hopefully I can add a little to your knowledge and application of it. So we begin here in verse 15. Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him, that is Jesus, in what he said. Literally, the root word here means to ensnare, to trap like uh, one would snare an animal. Uh, The plan of the Pharisees is to to lay a trap for Jesus so that he um, is ensnared by his own words. Verse 16, so they sent their disciples to him, 
along with the Herodians. So we have these Pharisees and the Herodians. Now this becomes a very strange coalition because the Pharisees were among those who largely opposed Roman occupation uh, and expected God any day now to send a military Messiah to overthrow the emperor and those who worked with Rome uh, and the Roman local authorities, including the King Herods of the time. There are three King Herods in the New Testament, uh, uh, which includes this group, hence their name, the Herodians, the backers of Herods. Uh, these two groups of the Pharisees and the Herodians didn't agree on a whole lot, actually. They uh, did not agree politically or religiously, but they were uh, in agreement that Jesus was a threat. He was a threat to each of them in different ways and a threat to their positions uh, and the benefits that they were extracting from those positions under these present circumstances of Roman occupation. So they come together um, uh, to come uh, to Jesus. And they say to him first, teacher, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to speak in, in uh, the tone that I assume that they were using, but I'll do it in English because um, I can read Greek, but speaking it, not so much. Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Now, this is um, much more a setup than a compliment. Uh, they uh, do not truly respect Jesus, but um, they're, uh, in a way, publicly buttering him up uh, for this um, trap, verse 17. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Now, um, there's a specific Greek word at play here, and in my humble opinion, the NRSV gets it correct. Is it legal to pay taxes? Other translations, including the message that we'll um, hear this Sunday, say something like, tell us, is it right uh, or uh, should? Uh, the, the word used is specific. Is it legal? Uh, is it legal to pay, pay taxes? Or the reverse could have been asked, is it illegal to not pay taxes? Um, some translations that have it, is it right, um, I think are asking a different question. Uh, some things are legal that aren't right. Things There are things that you could legally do that aren't, well, that, that some would not judge as moral. You have the legal right to say horrible things. That doesn't make it right to say them. Verse 18, but Jesus, aware of their malice, aware of their um, evil intent, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius, that is uh, the common coin of the day, uh, equivalent to uh, typical wage for one day's labor. Verse 20, he said to them, uh, whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, the emperor's, the Caesar's. And then he said to them, then give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. You um, might know the King James Version, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God's. The Greek word here for give or render is apodote. It means to give, but more precisely, it means to give back. It means to pay back, to return, or as in the King James, to render. Uh, an older word that, that means to return or repay or to submit, as in surrender. Verse 22, when they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. Well, I'll have more to share in our sermon this Sunday about this uh, question and uh, the question that Jesus uh, implies in how he responds. So please join me in worship again this week. Thanks for joining me once again here in the pastor study. Until next time, let us be doers of God's word and not hearers only. God bless you. Bye-bye.